Hey there, this is Derek. Today I'm going to talk about six signs of weak writing. And this is kind of an interesting topic. Um, a couple years ago I tried to find some ghostwriters or some uh, co-authors who could help me produce more content more quickly. I'm trying to focus on fiction and I found left to my own devices I might put out a novel every three months and do maybe four a year, which is actually great. But if you really want to, um, I'm in another group called 20 Books to 50K and they have a phrase that's Patterson the shit out of your career, which means if you really want to go big, you have to find ways of streamlining your creative process so you can put out more content more quickly. It doesn't mean you're writing less quality books. It doesn't mean you're lowering your standards. It just means you're using your time better by leveraging other people's time or a team or building a community or figuring out you know, how you can cut corners um, in your own process, which doesn't mean again that you're like writing crappy books. It just means, for example, um, I know that in my creative process when I'm writing a book, I spend lots and lots of time procrastinating. So if I can figure out a way to outsource the stuff that I avoid because I don't enjoy it and kill the procrastination and only focus on the stuff I'm really good at, I could have a severe boost of, severe is too negative, but I could have a big boost of, of creativity. Um, also things like, you know, using um, a different writing setup to draft or to pants. Um, there are different kind of techniques. I've made a video recently about um, NaNoWriMo prep, but it's actually about boosting your word count speed and goals. But my point is, um, I'm looking for ways to boost my production so I can put out more books because I want to not only make a living with my writing for myself, but I really want to build like a, um, not exactly a publishing company, but a, a branch, an empire. I want to put out a lot of stories. I want to have a lot of books. Um, so instead of doing four a year, I want to do like 20 books a year, which means I can get to, you know, a hundred books in five years, which would be awesome. And part of what I've been doing this week, this is the first week of 2019, I've already started this new thing um, with a new partner who's really good at the marketing and the ads and the audiobooks and like the whole other stuff that happens after the production. Um, we're gonna team up. I'm gonna work with a team of paid interns to try to turn out more content so that he can take it from there. Um, which means we've gotten a whole bunch of applications and I have to go through and kind of vet and see who's a good writer, who's a bad writer. So I made a list of six signs of weak writing. This is kind of difficult to talk about because I can read something and um, it's hard to communicate why it's no good because on the surface it can look like pretty high quality fiction. There's nothing wrong with the writing. It's not full of um, typos though I will add I didn't write this down but um, especially if you're submitting to a job or an agent or a publisher you shouldn't have typos in your book. You should be careful with punctuation. You should capitalize the words that should be capitalized. You shouldn't have a lot of spelling or type uh, grammatical errors even if your writing is good, and I'll overlook a lot of that. If your writing is really good, if your scene description um, or characterization is great, I'll overlook typos because I know that we can just fix those easily. I'm more concerned about the writing, but still, you know, if you're really applying for something, you wanna be careful um, to use a program like Grammarly or ProWritingAid and just fix those things. Those are easy fixes. Um, but I've also been doing this with, in some of the other stuff I do, I let people send me their first chapter or their um, novel outline and so I've been spending a lot of time, I don't really do editing anymore, like full on um, line editing or copy editing. And the reason generally is because I feel bad because in almost all cases, uh, writers aren't ready for editing. They don't have a strong story yet. They didn't write their book to satisfy an audience deliberately. They're kind of just like trying to write a novel by throwing paint to the wall and seeing what sticks. So most of the time I can suggest thousands of ways they can improve that book. Um, and it's very valuable for them because everybody can tell them like what what often happens is that um, they're trying to get published, they're trying to sell books and nothing happens. They, they can't give it away. They don't get any reviews. They get no traction. Um, that's often a sign of weak writing, but no one's going to tell you to your face that your book is weak or that even if they do, they won't tell you why. They may say, you know, no thanks, this isn't a good fit, but keep submitting because they want to be positive. But the truth is your book just isn't good enough to satisfy readers. There are problems with it. Um, so I'm going to try to make this video as kind of a general. These are probably the things that are the cause of your book not being successful or the cause of your writing not taking off. Um, whether or not you've been self-publishing or applying for you know, a publishing deal with agents or publishers. So the first one, number one, um, is overwriting. 
and that just means your writing is too fancy. And this is really tricky because a lot of writers, especially first time writers or amateur writers, they fall in love with their own sentences because it's fun to play with words. And if you put together a really beautiful sentence, you think it's awesome. Um, and you'll probably choose like fancy words to show off your vocabulary and put them together in new unique ways because you want to be creative. And the problem with fancy writing is it calls attention to the words and not the story. It's distracting actually. If you are putting in fancy writing, um, readers are distracted out of the story and they are focused on the author. It's kind of like the man behind the curtain pulling back and saying like, did you see that cool thing I did with those words there? Um, you don't want to be present by your, um, uh, I, I can't think of a better way to say this, but a present by your presence. You don't want your presence to be obvious. You want to be behind the scenes. You want your characters and your story and your setting um, to speak for themselves and to hook attention and to attract readers and get them into the story. Like what's happening is the important thing, not the words you're choosing to explain what's happening. And this is kind of, um, you'll always hear this, this phrase, show don't tell, and it's a little difficult to really pin down. Um, but if you're describing, if your words are referring to what's happening, it's like if you're pointing to this thing is happening and it's really cool, you should go check this thing out, you've made a big mistake. You want the thing itself to be written in a way that engages readers without you needing to tell readers that this is a cool thing that's going on. I, I often see something like um, an echo. If you're not sure that your writing is confident enough, if you're not sure your writing is good enough, there's like an echo where you repeat yourself to make sure readers realize how important that um, paragraph was or how cool that thing you said was. So you're kind of like, you say a thing and then you're like, reaffirming the thing that you've said to make sure that readers get it. Um, that's a sign of weak writing, something you want to be careful of. That really should be its own point, but I'm going to just include it in number one, which is overwriting. Um, unusual word choice, the cadence of your writing. You want it to sound kind of like if you were telling a story to friends, it should sound kind of like how you speak. Um, it might be a little different if you're writing epic fantasy and the, your characters are speaking a different way. But even so, for me personally, I'm not really an epic fantasy reader, but I don't want to read fancy old-fashioned writing. When I read epi epic fantasy that has that stuff, I tune out because that's boring for me. I want, you know, a, a great story that's told in an epic fantasy setting. Um, the story has to be enough on its own, not the words that you choose. So that's a sign of weak writing. It's why I think Hemingway, but I might be misquoting, says, kill your darlings. That just means Anything that you think is awesome is probably distracting and you need to get rid of it and focus on simple, clean writing. Um, so some of these samples I've been going through, there's a bunch of them that are kind of fancy writing, which isn't bad in itself. Like it means the writers have a great grasp of English. They're creative. They're telling these stories. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that all of the writing is distracting enough that I can't get into the story. So the ones that really hold my attention are the clean, concise, clear, normal words um, that disappear because the story is so strong. Really cool, exciting things are happening. The characters are interesting and dynamic. The, the um, dialogue is natural and refreshing and interesting. It makes the characters seem real. So you want that to happen. You, you don't want highbrow distracting language. Anyway, that's number one. It's a sign of weak writing, so be careful, especially if you think you're a really good writer. That's often a sign um, that you're falling prey, you're falling victim. You're falling in the trap of making these mistakes, of, of overwriting. Um, number two, paying attention to everything. Uh, when you're writing, you're basically like it's sh you're shining a spotlight into the dark. Um, whatever you choose to tell readers about, you're spotlighting. And so you have to be careful not to spotlight everything. And you also have to be careful because everything you spotlight is going to seem important. So you only want to spotlight the important things. If you're describing a scene or a setting or like what the character is wearing or whatever, you want to put enough features that readers can picture what's going on and you want to make sure they're the right features that have an emotional timber to them. Like when you're describing a setting or a room, you want to make sure you know how you want readers to feel about the scene that's going to take place in that room. Is it a positive scene? Is it a negative scene? Um, and by choosing what you choose, by deciding what you choose to focus on in that room and selecting the objects that are going to represent that space, you're subconsciously biasing readers to have a certain kind of emotional experience, um, which can be done really well. But basically, you you don't want to just 
go overboard with describing everything. You don't want to have um, tons of, like you're not turning on the lights and showing everything that, that exists. You have to be deliberate about showing readers what's important for the story. Um, there's an old adage, I don't know who said it, but if you have a gun in chapter one, that gun has to be used by the end of the book. So if you show readers a gun to show conflict, it has to be part of the story. So if you do have like a shooting in, in chapter nine or whatever, you want to, you don't want it to be like all of a sudden she kept a gun in her drawer. So she pulled it out and shot him. You don't want it to be sudden. You want to make sure you plant that gun well in advance so readers know it's there so that it's not like you're just pulling a rabbit out of a magical hat. That's another sign of amateur writing. It probably could be its own point, but I'm going to put it in here. Um, you don't want to, like when you're problem solving, when you need something to happen, what usually happens when you're revising, you're like, oh, there's a gun here. I better put that in and explain to readers why there's a gun here, or that there is a gun here. But you don't want that to be right before the action scene where the gun is used. You want that to be much um, in advance somewhere else so that it's not just an obvious, um, it's not like you don't want it to just be like magic, like you're just fixing it because um, it seems heavy handed. You want to make sure you place it much earlier. But if you do place something earlier, um, people call it a red herring. Like if you put a gun in chapter one and it never goes off, readers are going to feel cheated or disappointed. So in some books, in some contexts, um, it's okay to plant a few red herrings that are distractions from the real thing that's going to happen. But then the real thing has to be better and more exciting than the fake flag, the false flag that you planted earlier, or readers are going to feel cheated. And if you plant a fake flag or false flag and you never come back to it again, readers are going to feel let down, disappointed, because they will assume anything you say in the story is going to be used again. It's a clue. And readers like to solve puzzles and clues. Readers are always going to be putting all these pieces together and trying to project what's going to happen. Your job as an author is to make sure you um, meet their expectations, but also subvert and invent new ways to surprise and delight them. Um, it's fine if you just like, if you just meet their expectations, it's okay, but they're also going to feel kind of disappointed. They'll be like, this was good, but I figured it out and it was just, you know, it was, it was good and it was satisfying. But for a really good book, it has to be different and better than what they expected to happen. You have to set them up to expect one thing and then deliver something even better so they're surprised and entertained. Um, anyway, so don't focus on things that don't matter. Don't focus on, especially in terms of, and we'll talk more about background later, but um, I see a lot of like background dumps where you know the whole history of every character is spelled out. Most of that stuff doesn't matter, um, especially if readers don't care yet about your characters, especially if there's no action and nothing is happening yet, so they're not paying attention. Um, readers don't care about what happened 20 years ago. They care about what's happening right now as long as you've made them care about it by creating sympathetic characters and creating conflict in your scenes. Um, and we'll talk more about that later, but you don't want to, you only want to give like the bare minimum information so that readers care about what's going on so that you can keep going in your story. Um, so it's a mistake to just, you know, share all this background and crap with your readers. They don't care about it. Um, it's like at a certain time, if you want to deepen your the emotional relevancy of your characters, if you want readers to be even more invested in your characters, you can share some backstory later. It usually doesn't happen in the first couple books. In the first couple books, if you have a lot of backstory explaining how these characters got here or where these characters came from, that's a mistake. So get rid of all of that, especially in the first couple chapters. Later on in the book, some backstory is okay if it deepens relevance. Um, but be careful not, you don't want to share everything. You don't want to share what happened before you want to share what's happening right now and give just enough contextual clues to make it readers have to be able to picture what's going on so the setting the description it is really important if it's just like characters in action but readers can't picture it they won't be invested they'll they'll give up really quickly in the first chapter if they can't see what's happening and so your job as an author is not only to tell them what's happening and who it's happening to but it's to give them enough picture that they can fill in the blanks and they can see it happening in their head. So that's why description is really important. Um, and that's not a different thing. I'm just going to include that in number two, which is attention to everything. You have to be deliberate about what you're spotlighting and it has to be the, the important stuff. Um, okay.
So number three is having a wall of words. And this is the one I think is the hardest one to, to explain. Um, but if I have a whole bunch of samples and I'm trying to vet writers to see if they're any good at writing, um, I have to kind of skim through the first few pages of a chapter and see whether or not anything hooks my attention. And what I'll find is some of them hook my attention and I pay attention to what's happening. And because I'm paying attention, I think the writing is good. Some of them are just a wall of words. Some of them I'll just skim through. Nothing catches my attention. There's nothing interesting. Or like the writing is fine. The writing in itself is fine, but I'm not emotionally invested. I don't care about what's happening. And it's not my fault because you as an author have to, it's your job to write in a way that makes readers pay attention. If you're not doing that and readers don't get invested in your story, that's your job. It's not readers' problem for not paying attention or not being dedicated. You can't ask your readers or your reviewers um, to pay more attention or, or to read more carefully because like you have a good story. That's your fault. Um, so the reason I think something is a wall of words is because there's, no, there's not enough conflict or there's not enough sympathy. Basically, you don't care. Readers don't care about, about what's happening. If they don't care, it's because there's no conflict. The way, to have, the way to get people to care about what's happening is to have conflict in every scene. And there should be conflict in every scene. And it should be immediate. In the first chapter, there should be immediate conflict. It doesn't have to be explosions and, and, and shootings and stuff. Um, it doesn't have to be even fights or arguments. There can just be slight, subtle tension. Um, there's a, a mismatch between what the characters want and what they actually have. Or there's some under the surface stuff. The, the person goes to work and she has some like under the surface stuff. Her boss is a little unhappy with her because she forgot something. Or um, her coworker is an asshole and he's cheating um, on somebody else. Or he stole her work and is turning it in for her, himself. Little things that may not even be the main story, but they're just there to make readers care about the beginning of your story. Because if you don't have tension or conflict in the beginning of your story, readers aren't going to pay attention. Um, so you always need to build tension and conflict into every scene, and you have to do it deliberately. If there's not enough tension or conflict, that's a problem you have to solve. So in every scene, if there's not immediately obvious tension and conflict um, in every scene, if it's just characters like laughing and talking, that's a problem. There are, there are exceptions. I mean, there are some scenes that are going to be light scenes. There are some scenes that are going to be... Um, like emotional scenes, gooey scenes where, you know, the love interests are getting to know each other. There may not be immediate conflict at the beginning. I would always end one of those scenes with a huge explosion or bang. Like if I have a slow, thoughtful scene, I probably wouldn't end it with like, good night and they go to sleep. I would end it with someone breaks in or they have a realization or they figure something out or like a surprising twist. Um, so the conflict can come at the end of the scene and that's still okay, but I would still have a lot of conflict in the beginning, even for a lot of those slow scenes. So um, conflict is how you make readers care about what's happening, but also sympathy. Um, readers have to like your characters. They have to know and like your characters. If they don't know and like your characters, they don't care about what's happening. So especially in the first chapter, if you're just all action and witty banter and dialogue, um, readers aren't going to fall in love with your characters because they're witty or clever or they think they're awesome. Um, and there are some genres where this is like, I write kind of dark, slow, moody fantasy, so I don't really have witty banter very much anyway. Um, there are some things like in space opera or urban fantasy maybe where there's a lot more like witty banter and silly jokes and stuff. Um, and even in those, I don't think re readers will really care. That's like readers might enjoy those if they already like the characters, but that's not a way to get readers to like the characters. Um, you build vulnerability by showing weakness. I think that's true. Um, so sympathy, if you want people to be sympathetic with your characters, you have to show not necessarily weakness, but um, a position of lack. If they're just badass, awesome um, protagonists who have all their shit figured out, and they're just going in there killing the bad guys and they're totally, you know, kick ass. Um, that's kind of okay, like to hook in the very beginning, but then you immediately want to show conflict, tension, um, insecurity to some extent, doubt, fear. Um, you want to show vulnerability and you want to show it kind of quickly. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, you don't want to like, um, with emotional stuff, you don't want to be like, them bursting out in tears all the time. I wouldn't have my protagonist cry like at all, but maybe 
towards the end of the book when you get to the dark night of the soul it can be a little more emotional in the first few chapters you really don't want to have a lot of emotion you want your characters to be bearing the frustration or the guilt or the difficulty but those things should all be building towards the pinnacle of the the conflict which happens like two-thirds into the book so you don't want the characters to be overwhelmed at the beginning of the book you want them to try to be dealing with stuff um, but you still want to show them as vulnerable um, as a way to build sympathy there are other ways in my in my course um bestseller blueprint i have a whole list of ways to build sympathy with your your characters and, and character outlining but it's important you don't have to build like a whole character bible but you have to start off by doing some things that make your characters immediately likable um things like you know they're taking they're standing up for somebody weaker or they they're taking care of a little um brother or they're volunteering at the homeless shelter or they're feeding stray cats in the street something that makes them likable it could even be a little hobby um like a side hobby that they have i'm trying to think um if i have any of those oh in, in the one i'm working on right now it's epic fantasy she is a prisoner in a in a cage in a tower she's been there her whole life but she makes like all the only access she has to anything is straw she gets straw for her bathroom basically so and she has nothing to do so for years and years and years she's been practicing making little straw dolls um that she throws out her window and she exchanges for books basically um that's kind of a cool little hobby that makes her likable and also a little bit sad and tragic because what's going to happen is she's like made herself um friend she's like made herself a little dollhouse with all these friends that she's named and talked to um and then she loses control of her powers and like bursts into a ball of fire so she burns all of those things all the things she's made all of her worldly possessions go up in a puff of smoke um that's all in the first chapter that's a really powerful way to make my character very sympathetic before any action really happens um i've made her very sympathetic so she, you know through the progress of the book she'll be a hero you need your character to be heroic even when they're weak even when they're coming from a position of no power um fear doubt whatever even if they don't know how to be strong they still want to stand up to um power unchecked power anyway so that's kind of like that's what i think um makes the difference between hooking readers attention or just having a wall of words if you just have a wall of words it's, it means there's all this stuff and the writing might be fine but none of it grabs the reader's attention um there could also be an issue with like variance varying your sentence structure variance variancing like very varying um the first sentences of your paragraph creating the best hook like the the first sentence of the first chapter is super important so your hook should already be like that's the first sentence of your first chapter is kind of what makes them pay more attention. So if you have a really good first chapter or first sentence of your book, um, then you don't have to work as hard going forward because if you hook their attention from the first sentence, they're going to keep reading to find out what you are talking about. So like in Twilight, the first sentence is something like, I knew only, you know, two things about Edward Cullen first I was madly in love with him second he wanted to kill me or he wanted to eat me something like that it's a super powerful hook that you know colors the rest of the reader's experiences with the first chapter and the rest of the book um often you won't know how to write your first sentence until you finish the book so don't worry about making it perfect in the beginning but definitely when you're revising once you finish a first rough draft and you're going back and revising the first sentence and the last sentence of every scene is super important so make sure those are really powerful really strong hooks with built-in conflict um that's going to help a lot with read through and reader engagement okay this is number four and this is emotional consistency um and what this means is your whole scene should have a certain kind of emotional feel and you need to be careful about throwing in stuff that doesn't match um that feeling you also have to be careful about how your character should be feeling about the events that are surrounding them so for example um if there's a tight battle scene and they were just attacked or they've just been attacked or they're going to be attacked or they have to go and solve this mystery before someone else is murdered um if there's conflict and death and violence they're not just going to be like lightly making jokes um maybe in the beginning like if that's their job but even so like if they're fbi agents at a crime scene it's still kind of like it makes them unlikable if they're too um 
what's the word, trite about it. If they're, doing, if they're making jokes, they're like, oh look, another dead body, so what, who cares? If they don't care about justice or murder, they're not gonna be very likable characters. There might still be some of that banter, like in an urban fantasy, if they're off killing demons or whatever, they might be, you know, killing thousands of demons and also making snide, snarky remarks about it. That's okay for that genre. But when someone close to them dies or when they are personally threatened or someone they love is threatened, they're not gonna be making jokes. Um, so you wanna be careful, like, depending on the, the what's happening in the scene, how does it personally affect your characters? How are they feeling? Um, you don't wanna throw them off the deep end and have them like crying and sobbing in the corner. You, but you also like, if you do have them sobbing in the corner, you don't want them to be joking around and making, um, s making jokes in the next scene. Like you need to give them time to switch back and forth. Um, it's a sign of weak writing when, it, when characters can just be happy and sad, you know, back and forth, just a, a click of a button or the flip of a switch or whatever. Um, some people are like that. Some people really can, you know, they, they are moody, I guess. Um, I like to write kind of stronger, more stable characters so that when they get upset or when they feel happy, it's a bigger deal. Like if they're happy, like they're surrounded by friends, they're safe, they're making jokes. Um, I want them to revel in that emotional experience and being like, holy crap, this is the happiest I've ever been. And I'll have that happen right before it all gets taken away so that there's a, a balance. Um, because y the dark scenes, like the violent, dark, emotional scenes, they're not gonna be powerful unless you've already put a happy light scene before it. So you always have to be careful about the going back and forth. Um, but you have to be careful that you're not switching too quickly and you don't want to just throw everything in the same scene um, too quickly because if it's all just, you know, you want readers to feel a certain way also. You want readers to match what's going on in your scene. So if you're throwing in happy and sad stuff or jokes, um, or what I see often is like maybe flirting, like two characters are flirting when they're also trying to solve a murder. Um, and maybe to some extent that can be the case, but you don't want people, you don't want your characters to be thinking about sex or thinking about hooking up when they're also trying to save the world or something. Um, and yes, I write young adult and in young adult, that's often exactly what they're doing. They're, they're, they're thinking about sex, but what actually happens is they're irresistibly attracted to each other, but they also know that their feelings need to be put off because they're silly. Like, I, I can't be falling in love with this person because he's trying to kill me or because, you know, we're trying to save the world. I have this bigger issue with young adult usually, like, they want something else. The romance is a distraction from their true goals and they resist it as long as possible and then finally they can't resist it anymore. Anyway, but they, they shouldn't be, like, casually flirting with each other. Um, because it makes them less likable. With the exception of, if you're writing like a reverse harem or if you're writing a love triangle, often one of the bad guys, like she's usually attracted to like a, a quiet, powerful, strong, deep emotional guy um, who's hard to read, who's like a mystery. And then she's also attracted to like the snarky, flirty, confident guy. Um, but he's usually the bad guy because even though it's, he's kind of cool, even though he's a little sexy because he's flirting, readers aren't going to like him as much. They're not going to be rooting for him. Even if he's sexy, he's not likable, which is why he's not one of the main characters. With your protagonist, yeah, it's more important to make them likable than to make them sexy. So you have to be kind of careful about that. Number five is information dumps. Um, and this is a tricky thing, but it's actually pretty easy to see in, in, in writing, in amateur writing. It's an easy tell of amateur writing. When you start a scene or a chapter, if there's like a paragraph or a page or five pages of backstory before you get to the action, that's a big red flag. That's kind of an immediate no for me. That's too bad because maybe once it, I'll skip down. Like if the action, the dialogue is still good, that's fine. I can just tell them to cut all that crap out. But Writers aren't going to sit through a backstory, uh, sorry, readers aren't going to sit through a backstory to figure out why this is important before you get to the action. They're not going to sit there. They don't have the patience. So you can't expect your readers to study before they get into your story. You can't tell them like, my story is awesome, but before you understand what's happening in my story, you have to read these five pages of backstory that happened, you know, five years ago or 20 years ago. Um, I also see a big problem with stuff like, um, time switching. So a good story is going to be mostly linear 
Um, and it's true, there are some fantastic examples where there are, you know, flashbacks, and you can have flashbacks later, like once characters are invested in your story, sorry, once readers are invested in your characters and your story, they will be paying more attention. The problem is in the beginning, in the first couple chapters, they're not really paying attention. Readers are just skimming through your first couple chapters to see like, do I care about this? Is this any good? Am I gonna invest, you know, hours of my time reading this whole book? So the first couple of chapters are still kind of sales copy. You're still proving yourself. They haven't committed to reading the book yet. Um, this is especially true for nonfiction. It's also true for fiction, but the way to fix it, and like in nonfiction, the way to fix it is to say, you know, this book is gonna help you with these things. You focus on the reader, you focus on the new opportunity, you focus on the, the problems and the challenges to let readers know that you understand how they feel, and you promise that this reader, this book, like if they commit and read this book, it's gonna help them solve the thing that they want. It's like, it's, promise them it's gonna give them the benefits that they bought the book for. Um, but for fiction, it's kind of the same thing. If they read Urban Fantasy, you wanna deliver on the things that they enjoy about urban fantasy immediately in the first couple of chapters, like in the first scene. They need to know that they're in the right place and that this is the kind of book that they enjoy reading. So often, um, for example, for urban fantasy, I would start with a, a quick fight or action scene at the beginning to show like magic, conflict, creatures, um, cool stuff happening. And it's true that readers don't care about anything at the beginning, but if you can hook them with a little bit of action before you go into some of the slower stuff, the explanation stuff, that can help a lot. Um, in some of my books, I've used a preface, and I've used like 20 years ago there was a murder, and now here's the like slower beginning of the story. Um, and I won't necessarily say that's a bad thing. I think if you have a slower, like for Paranormal Romance, which is usually kind of a slower build up, um, if you have a book that takes three or four chapters, to build before anything exciting happens, that's a problem. Sometimes you can fix that problem by having something exciting happen in a preface. Um, often like a murder mystery or investigation scene, like before the victim's family comes to the detective to ask him to take the case, there's a little scene that shows the villain killing somebody. Um, if you have a little bit of blood or violence in the very beginning, it can hook their attention enough to read the first couple chapters. Um, there's also a saying with writing like, every good book starts with a murder or a body or something like that. If you start off, and this is something else, but basically the stakes have to be mortal. Um, in any book, even a book like a contemporary light romance or sweet romance or a high school book or whatever, even if there's no murder, the stakes have to be mortal, which means um, your characters have to feel like their identity is threatened to the point where they feel like they are going to die if they don't, you know, do something. Um, so that's what it means by mortal stake. So you don't always have to have like an actual dead body, but symbolically things should matter to the point where readers, the, the character feels like their life is ending, everything is ending, um, everything needs to be taken away from them. So the stakes have to be really high for your main characters. If they aren't, it doesn't matter. The story doesn't matter. Um, I see this especially like with, if you're writing like a memoir or a biography or you're just telling your life story, um, this can be a really big problem because if you don't have violence or murder in your book, um, it can be difficult to get readers to care about what's happening to you. You may think you have a really exciting, interesting life, but um, chances are, I mean, I don't wanna say your life hasn't been that interesting, but um, most of us feel like our lives matter because they do to us. It's difficult to communicate that value to other people. It's difficult to get other people to care about our lives and our history as much as we do. Um, you can do it with really tight storytelling, but the problem with most biography and memoir is that it doesn't follow a normal hero's journey plot. It doesn't follow any kind of a structure. It's just a, a bunch of little scenes, which might be really interesting scenes, but it never builds to a satisfying emotional payout, which is why people read books. Um, so that's kind of something to be aware of. But my point with all of this was, you need to start with the action faster. I don't necessarily recommend writing a, a, um, a preface. I actually think because I, I did prefaces in my earlier book books because I was kind of still an amateur. I was still figuring things out. And so I, I added those prefaces because I didn't know how to hook readers' attention in the first chapter. Um, I've learned since then how to do it much better. So my books generally now 
have no preface. They have a really strong first sentence, first paragraph where all of the conflict and tension of the world is built into the story from the beginning of the first page of the first chapter. Um, I'm getting better at doing that. And so I don't need a preface anymore, but I also don't need, there's a way to, to put the backstory into the action. So you need your story to always be happening right now. You don't want like a character telling about what happened to them a long time ago. Um, when you're doing backstory, you don't really want your character to tell readers um, about the backstory. It's a little better if whenever you can, you have another person so that two characters can reveal information about themselves so you can tell backstory information as part of a conversation, as a dialogue, which is going to be a lot more interesting. You want to be really careful about just telling readers the backstory yourself. Like if the, narr the narrator basically is just telling the information to the readers directly. That's an information dump. Um, and sometimes you kind of have to do it, but you want to be careful to break it up into small chunks and to do it within the context of the action. So you start the scene with the action, um, with something exciting, with something happening. Like there's, in every scene, your, your character needs to want to do something and they need to be thwarted and they need to make a new plan and they need to try to do something else. There should always be like an end goal your characters aren't just sitting around doing nothing, waiting for things to happen, um, reflecting on their life. You don't want your, your characters just thinking about stuff that happened a long time ago. And also, I kind of touched on this earlier, but you need to be careful about your slow scenes and your fast scenes. So if it's an action scene or if it's a danger scene, you don't want your characters to be like discussing their past or you don't want the narrator to be dumping all this information about all this backstory that happened a long time ago. Um, what happened a long time ago doesn't matter at all until your readers are invested in the story. So until they care about your characters and until they are invested in the conflict and the emotional stakes of the conflict, um, they don't care what happened a long time ago. So you need to give them just enough information to kind of explain things. Um, but for example, in the one I'm working on right now, there's a ton of backstory. There's these five kingdoms. There's the whole story of like how these kingdoms came about. There's a whole um, political hierarchy between these like five princes and kings and queens and each one has three different magical like protectors. Um, but I don't need to tell readers any of that in the first two or three chapters. What I need to do is get them invested in the story and, the, and in the conflict. So I immediately start off with like a really powerful like in the first, she murders someone on accident in the, the end of the first chapter. Um, in the second chapter, they're fighting a dragon. Like it's, it's action first, they run away, they escape. And then when they have a quiet moment and they're not immediately being threatened, um, then they can talk and discuss things and ask questions and, and reflect like, what happened? What was that? Why is the dragon trying to kill me? Who are you? Why did you rescue me? Um, you want to be careful to save all the information, all the info dumps, for the slower scenes where there isn't immediately, where there isn't immediate um, danger. So that's kind of a, an important tip, but you also wanna be careful not to start your chapters with the explanation. You don't wanna start your chapters with a few pages of like, this is who these characters are, this is where they came from, this is why it matters, um, especially if it's just exposition, if you're just telling readers. Um, and this is a big problem, especially if all you have is exposition. I've read some books where they barely have any action. All of the scenes are referred to off screen. All the things that happen, all the really important stuff happens off screen and the characters are just sitting around and the narrator's just telling readers about those characters. Um, you always want as much as possible to stick with the present action. So it doesn't really matter, like you can be using, doesn't mean you have to be using like present tense. Um, you can use be using past tense. Past tense works really well. You wanna be careful about not using past tense part of participle, um, like, you know, he had gone, I had learned, I had been over there. You can actually search like when you're editing for um, had or I'd or he'd like um, apostrophe D, because if you have a lot of those, especially if you have a whole string of those, that's something you probably should fix up. If you can change it to past simple, um, it'll just make cleaner, more engaging writing. Okay, so the last one, which is number six, is uh, not enough samples or not enough relevant samples. So this one is only applicable, applicable if you're like applying for something or if you're trying to get an agent maybe. Um, kind of depends what you're trying to do. But I see some people who maybe they're just starting out. Maybe they've written some 
short stories. Um, maybe they've written some poetry. Maybe they've written some nonfiction blog articles. Their writing seems okay. It seems fine, but I can't really see whether or not they would be able to write the kinds of books that I'm interested in because I haven't seen those samples. So if you're putting together a portfolio of writing samples, um, first, try to write some short scenes or first chapters that, that do all of this stuff, that hit all of these things and avoid all of these weak writing mistakes. Because if you make these mistakes, people are gonna kind of um, shut you down or they'll say no pretty fast. But also you wanna be building up your um, expertise and your knowledge and your, your writing skills and ability by trying out some new forms. Like maybe you always write a certain kind of epic fantasy, try out something different. Try out urban fantasy, try out um, maybe contemporary romance. You don't have to write germ uh, you don't have to write genres you're not interested in. I would definitely focus on picking a few genres you enjoy and that you're interested in, but then don't just play around and experiment. Focus on what do those bestsellers do? What, what do what's, why do those books succeed? Um, read the first page. You can look at the top like 20 or 100 bestsellers in your genre and you can click look inside on Amazon. You don't have to buy all those books. You can click look inside and see what they do in the first page, in the first chapter. Um, what are they doing successfully? Make a list of those things and try to reverse engineer that. Try to write a first chapter for an amazing book in your genre. You don't have to write the full book, but um, I would actually strongly recommend focusing on first chapters. Write 10 amazing first chapters for 10 potential series to get better at writing first chapters. If you don't do that, you can write 10 full books and not really get good at anything because you're trying to do everything at once. And it's gonna take you a long time to write 10 full books. And none of it's gonna matter because if you haven't written a good first chapter, nobody's gonna read your 10 books. Um, I would really focus on becoming a better first chapter writer and practicing writing first chapters until you can write amazing first chapters. If you can write amazing first chapters, people are gonna read your books. Um, later, you can figure out how to write good books or how to write satisfying endings, but it's really important to focus on writing good first chapters. So that's something I think a lot of people don't do. And then people say, you know, well, but my book is so good, it gets really interesting in chapter six or chapter 12, but nobody reads it. Um, or like you send out a lot of ARC copies or you get a, a lot of beta readers or you ask your friends and family for book reviews but nobody will review it. It's probably because your book was boring and they didn't get into it because your first chapter didn't hold their attention. Um, so that's probably your problem. Like as a sign of weak writing, most people are probably not reading your past your first chapter because your first chapter isn't good enough. So focus on not just writing good books but really focus on improving your craft until you can write hooks. You, if you can't write like a, a good scene that hooks their attention and wants them to keep reading past, you know, the first chapter, you'll never sell any books because if people don't care about your characters and the events and the stakes and the world, if they don't care by the end of the first chapter, they're not going to buy it. They're not going to keep reading. Um, it'll just be, especially if it's like a free download. I hear people say like free books don't work because I've gotten 10,000 free downloads and nobody reads my book or buys my book or nobody reads book two. Um, that's a first chapter problem. To some extent, it's also a cover and a, a blurb problem because if your cover and blurb had been good enough, they would have at least opened up the book right away and started reading. And if your first page didn't hook them, they're gonna put it on the back burner because they have other more exciting books to read. Um, so definitely focus on like first sentences, first paragraphs, first chapter. That's like the most important thing you can possibly do when you're trying to become a better writer. But then also these are like the six there's a whole bunch of other ones, signs of weak writing. Maybe I'll do another one of these if you like them, but um, these are definitely the ones that I notice the most that I think you can fix the easiest. If you're aware of these six problems and you just learn to check yourself um, and not just like, I don't think you should just like let yourself write and draft a whole book and then try to revise it or fix it later because by that point you've done everything wrong. So even if you hire uh, an editor, I've, I've got some videos about working with an editor, but the problem, that, the problem is if you've already done all this stuff wrong, your editor can clean it up and fix it, but they're not gonna rewrite it for you. They're not gonna restructure because that's really, really hard work for someone to kind of take your book apart and move everything around and say like, this whole thing needs to be over here. This whole thing needs to be cut. That's hard work for an editor and you probably are gonna be too sensitive for that editor to even do his job. If, if the editor is like, 
this chapter needs to go, this chapter needs to go. Like nothing is happening, there's no tension, there's no conflict. This is an information dump. You need to break apart all this information and find a way to put it into dialogue or into the conflict or into the story. That's hard work. You can't pay someone to do that work for you, or if you can afford to pay, it's gonna cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. It's much easier for you to do this stuff on purpose, on the first draft, on the first time. So you need to learn how not to be a weak writer, how not to be an amateur writer, and do it deliberately, and, and write it well, write it right the first time. It's gonna save you so much time and effort and money, and you'll be able to put out high quality books faster and easier. Um, anyway, so I hope this video helps. If it does, um, leave a comment down below. If there are any other signs of weak writing that you hate when you read other books, like if you're a reader, if you read a lot of books um, and you give up on books right away, or books, maybe books annoy you and you, you notice things in books that you are like constantly annoyed by and you hate it when writers do these things, um, or if it's just like a sign of, you know, weak amateur writing, um, leave a comment down below. I'll turn this into a blog post later. So if you have any other good tips that, that you think would fit this list, um, comment down below. Thanks. Bye-bye.